do that. All right. All right, everyone, we're now recording. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Joan Alacqua. Um, I am executive director of the History Project. And uh, I'm just so pleased to see you all here. Um, some of you are frequent flyers, but for those of you who don't know us, the History Project is Boston's queer community archives. We are a 501c3. We've been around since 1980 documenting, preserving, and sharing LGBTQ history. Um, if you're interested in LGBTQ history, please be sure to follow us on social media to learn about our upcoming events and activities. Uh, I have two short plugs before we get to our conversation with KJ and Nikki. Um, the first are to save the dates for upcoming events. Um, on February 11th, we're partnering with Historic New England on an event called the Smart Set at Red Roof. Uh, Trip Evans, who's a professor of art history at Wheaton College, will be exploring the guest books and colorful characters of Red Roof, the home of noted economist and eventual Massachusetts Congressman A. Piot Andrew. Um, who else was there? Uh, Henry Sleeper, uh, I think factors heavily in this talk. So if you're familiar with Beauport, uh, I think we'll be in that neck of the woods. Um, and then on March 8th, we'll be holding our very first ever Wikipedia edit-a-thon in honor of International Women's Day. Um, so please save the date in your calendar and come help the History Project improve the digital visibility of women and celebrate International Women's Day by editing and adding articles on Wikipedia. Uh, some of the queer women we have already identified that we'd like to work on include Sarah Orne Jewett, Elaine Noble, Rita Hester, and Beverly Smith, among other others. My second plug is the, the plug for support. Um, first of all, thank you all to everyone who's already donated tonight. Your support really means a lot to us here at the archives. You help us to be able to do what we do year round. Um, we are community archives funded by the community. Any donation to the History Project directly supports our mission to document, preserve, and share LGBTQ history. So if you're interested in donating or learning more about your donation, um, gifts of any size help, and uh, you can feel free to check out more about us on our website or to email me and I'll tell you about what we do. Um, yeah, this is my first or our first event of 2021. I feel like I lost uh, hold of my spiel over the holidays and the winter, but <laughs> To conclude, thank you all so much for being here tonight for Trans History Linked. I'm going to introduce our two speakers. Uh, we have a couple of slides, and then I think we're going to open it up for audience questions pretty early on. So again, um, if you don't want to be on camera, use the, the chat function to ask questions. Andrew or I will read them out. Um, if you do want to be on camera, feel free to do the little hand raise function, which should be an option under chat if I'm recalling how Zoom works. Um, and we'll be sure to make sure that you're unmuted. So our speakers tonight are KJ Rawson. KJ is an associate professor of English and women's gender and sexuality studies at Northeastern University. His research and teaching interests include composition, rhetoric, digital media, and LGBT studies. His scholarship focuses on the rhetorical dimensions of queer and transgender archiving in both traditional and digital collections. Nikki Tantum is a digital archi archivist with a focus in community archiving. Uh, she currently works as the archivist for the Greater Boston Portuguese American Digital Archive at UMass Lowell. Her passion for community archiving grew out of her roles at the Transgender Digital Ar Ar Digital Transgender Archives. <laughs> My ar archive. My apologies. I keep flipping for some reason. I know it's DTA, but I want to put the T first. Happens a lot. Um, <laughs> So uh, Nikki worked to increase accessibility to trans-related re collections worldwide. Um, she also worked at the Worcester Historical Museum where she organized and preserved digital collections related to the local LGBTQ plus community. Thank you both so much for being here and I will let you take the floor. Thank, Thank you, you, Joan. I appreciate that intro. Um, yeah, I'm KJ Ross and I use he, him, his pronouns. And one thing I'll add about Nikki too is that she's now a board member for the DTA. Okay. So she may no longer be our digital archivist, but she is still an active member of the team. Um, so what we're planned for tonight is really to just start off with five minutes uh, each of just like some background, some information on the project. Um, so my, my part of this is to 
I don't know how I got muted there, but um, so my part in this is to give you a bit of background and um, help you understand what motivated the project and how it got started. And then I'll hand things over to Nikki, who will just show you around the site a little bit if you've never been there. We do have some discussion points that she and I can go back and forth on, so we could hold this conversation on our own if you'd like, but we, I think we'll kind of open it up pretty early and um, invite your, your questions, your conversation, because we, we really are happy to kind of have an open-ended conversation. All right, so what I would like to share with you and tell you about is really how the DTA came about. So I am the founder and continue to direct the project. The idea for the project initially came about around 2007, 2008. So I was a graduate student at the time, and I was really trying to understand where trans materials were being held, how they were being collected, who was accessing them, basically like what were the politics around transgender historical materials. But as I was trying to do this work, I realized very early on that it was actually quite difficult to locate trans-related historical materials. So you could go to queer archives, but even when you when you found your way to the queer archives, like the History Project, it could be really hard to parse out what is transgender in these collections? How do we, how do we kind of put parameters or wrap our arms around um, what this body of materials might look like? So given that, I decided that I wanted to really start a project that would increase the accessibility of transgender history. So that's the idea behind the project. That's where it got started. I had no idea <laughs> what would happen with it. I, I really had pretty small and humble intentions for what it might be when I initially created the project. Um, but I wanna give you a sense of where we're at now. So if you've never been to the site before, you can get to it at www.digitaltransgenderarchive.net. And there's lots of other URLs that we own that redirect there too. So if you get it slightly wrong, you'll probably still find your way there. Um, so the, the project itself has actually been live since January of 2016. So we are on our fifth year anniversary this month, which is really exciting. Um, we have a pretty good amount of materials, I think, for, for being a project that's been around for five years. Um, we have 64 different institutions that have contributed materials to the site. And those institutions are located in nine different countries. So just to be clear, the DTA itself, we don't actually have any physical holdings. So this is a thoroughly collaborative project. Sometimes we do have some physical artifacts that are kind of temporarily with us, but usually we then just take those, digitize what we can, and then find a permanent physical home for them. So we really work hand in hand with physical collections and we see our job as helping to facilitate greater access to those collections, not to replace them in any sense. So where our digitization happens really depends on the institution that we're working with. So we work with everything from community-based, even I would call them grassroots or private collections. So things that are in people's garages, basements, you know, the really um, off the map kind of collections all the way up through Ivy League institutions and then everything in between. So we obviously work with a lot of queer archives as well. And, and because we have such a range of different um, levels of collaborators, we do our digitization differently depending on the collaborator that we're working with. So some places want us to have no part of that process. Other places are happy to send us their stuff and we digitize it. Other places we do it on site, it really just depends. Um, we had a lab, <laughs> but we don't have one right now in part because of COVID. Um, also because the project just recently moved with me from Holy Cross to Northeastern. So we're also just trying to get resettled and figure out how we're gonna be operating in this new environment. So as you can see, we have a little over 8,600 items available online so far. Um, again, I'm pretty happy with the size of the collection, but as you might imagine, this is just such a small fraction of what's out there. And it's, it's almost like, I don't know, every time I, I find more materials, I'm like, we have to get these things up there too. So there's just a lot more out there. Um, our materials date from 1587 to the present, but that's quite misleading because the early stuff really are, those are outliers and Nikki's laughing because she can probably name them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so most of our collections are from the latter half of the 20th century, um, in part because we wanted to devote our attentions and our resources to materials created by trans identified folks because those materials are often hardest to find. All right, and so the last thing I'll talk about uh, before passing it over to Nikki is our scope statement. So this is, um, 
I think for many people outside of the project, one of the more interesting things about what we do, basically, how do we define transgender? How do we figure out what gets put in this collection? So what I would emphasize from this overview of our scope is that we moved away from transgender as an identity, and we instead collect materials related to transing gender as a practice, right? So that shift from identity to practice was super important for us because the term transgender is so new. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to bring together a wide range of historical materials on a global scale that related to gender practices. Um, the other thing I'll mention here is that we, we try to collect before 2000. Whenever I speak to archivists or historians, they kind of laugh at that <laughs> because, you know, what's 21 years in the scope of human history? <laughs> but it's important to us um, because since transgender became more widely adopted and circulating in the early 1990s, and since that was about concurrent with the rise of the um, internet, it means that after that point, it's much easier to find trans-related materials. So we really do try to focus our attention and our resources on pre-2000 and pre-1990 even when we can. All right, so that's all I'll say to start. Now, Nikki, I'll turn it over to you now. Great, thanks KJ. I am going to share my screen and show everyone a little bit about the Digital Transgender Archive website. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay, great. So this is the DTA. You'll have just seen a little glimpse of this on KJ slides. This is our home page. As you'll notice, the first thing front and center is the search bar and our browse functions. And this is really important because this is obviously how you get right into to collect into the collection. You know, we want people to be able to see the items as quickly as possible when they come to the site. You know, that's all the highlights. So that's front and center. Our homepage does highlight some um, featured collections if you scroll down, but I'm gonna focus a bit more on the browse functions and the searching so that you can get right in if you want to look at the collection yourself. So the browse functions are really ways to limit the collection to different things such as location, collection, um, topic. And this is a really great way to get into the material if it's something you're new to, if you don't know exactly what you want to look at yet, you can use these really wonderful browse functions to limit the things that you're looking at to find something you're interested in. So you can select, um, you know, the latest. I use this often because I always want to know the newest items on the DTA. So you can select the latest and see what the, the newest items are. Uh, you can look at things through our institution list, which as KJ mentioned, we have over 60 institutions worldwide, which is really amazing. And I always like to shout out that page because you can see a list of all of them. And then you can also look at items by location using the map function, which is what I'm going to show now. And the reason why I like to show this function so often is because I think this is a really, really accessible way into the collection. It allows you to look at our items across the world map to see where they're located. And this is a great way to look at maybe items in your hometown area that you might recognize the places or some of the images or places that you're interested in. And I just really love to look at, you know, the over 8,000 items on the site where they are across the world. As KJ mentioned, you know, I wish we had everything, we don't. So the places where they are, there aren't items yet, you know, that definitely does not mean there's not trans history there. It just means we haven't gotten a hold of it yet. But um, as it expands, you know, hopefully these locations will all expand as well. So I would recommend coming here if you're feeling a little overwhelmed with all the items on the site, you can always zoom into to an area. For example, I grew up in, in central Jersey. So you can always zoom in, see if there's any items from your hometown area. As you can see, just in this area, there's over a hundred items, which is really amazing. So I can go on there and, and see places that I knew that I grew up around and find items from trans history from those locations. So you can always come here to the map function uh, to look up your own area and to see um, what's available. I also wanted to get a little bit deeper into one item on the site, just to talk a little bit more, touch on some of the things KJ said about the scope of the DTA, as well as some of the ways we describe items. So I am going to look up items about Hannah Snell, and I am going to use the picture search. So as you'll see here, these are items about Hannah Snell. Um, Hannah Snell was known as the female soldier. You will see that 
said many times here, she became kind of a legend in England. Uh, she was born in 1923 in Worcester, England, and she um, had a kind of rough life growing up. She became an orphan in her teens, and she decided to go move with her, live in with her sister, and she ended up getting married to a sailor. And um, quickly after they were married, she got pregnant and her husband left her. So she was, she had her child, unfortunately, he died after seven months. And so she was kind of distraught. So she decided to join the army. Now I will say, of course, at the time, this is 1700s England, women obviously could not have joined the army. Um, I will say that those are the very basics of her story. Something that's interesting about these stories as you can imagine, um, when they're covered in newspapers, they're often, you know, you can even see just with Hannah's stories that her story gets, as she becomes a legend um, in, within these newspapers, you'll see her stories twist a little. So, you know, we don't even know 100% of who she was, uh, but that is the basics that we do know. So to kind of go further into this item, this is from the American Antiquarian Society. It's a newspaper item about Hannah Snell. This is the oldest item on the DTA about Hannah. And if you keep scrolling, you'll see the um, information about her, the metadata about this item, I mean. And one of the reasons I like to talk about Hannah Snell in the whole scope of the DTA is because just like KJ was talking about, this is an example of someone who was transing gender norms at the time. Um, of course, you know, the word transgender nowhere near in the 1700s that word when you know was not even in lexicon at all so you, even if hannah did identify that way it wouldn't have been possible but that's not even you know even if she didn't either way we still include that history because it's important to, to trans history overall um, so we include items such as hannah snell's story and as you'll see in the topics we're very careful not to put identities on people if we do not know the way that they identified specifically. So, you know, we would never include a tag such as transgender on this specific item, but we do use the word cross-dressing because she decided to go into the army and she um, dressed in male soldiers clothing to get into the army. Another reason why she became famous is because even after she was kicked out um, for being found, for being outed, she, the government decided to still give her a pension. So that's an interesting part of her story, but, um, back to the topics here, you'll see that uh, we have these pretty vague topics just based on what we know about her. And overall, I think that's something that's very an interesting side to the DTA and a very important side to the DTA is the way we describe items. Uh, I could go into that for a long time, but I know we're going to open it up to questions. So if anyone has questions about specifically how we describe items, I would love to talk more about that. But you know, these, the descriptions are very important, just like with this item where we don't want to put an identity on someone we don't know about. It is obviously just as important to include identifying terms on people where we do know their identity so that that history can be found and to use terminology that is specifically used within the community so that people can find history that reflects them. So I'm happy to open it up to questions now, um, unless KJ wants to add anything. No, that was great. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, so like I said, we, um, we're we happy to take questions now if you want to kind of jump in or if there's any way you want to steer the conversation or we have some some kind of pre-planned topics we could talk more about. So we have uh, a couple of questions already in the chat. Um, and here, I'm going to try to pop the chat out so I can read them. Um, one was technically, is the platform uh, Icelandora? The platform is not Icelandora. It is actually Samvera. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, I'm, I was actually, I saw that question, and how nice to see you. Um, I saw that question pop in there, and I am just actually finding a link for you of the platform that we use. So I'll throw that in the chat. Great. Um, and actually, these, these two other questions I think are can be paired together similarly. Um, Ani was asking about what's your decision-making process uh, when you describe for items where there's limited or potentially misleading information. And then Jake has a question um, basically asking about how you you transgender. Are you, yeah, how you transgender. Um, 
and sort of, I, I think in a, a similar vein, I'm curious about what kind of language you use um, to describe items that in their contemporary time would use language that we wouldn't use now? Is that too vague of a question or do you know where I'm going with that? Totally. Awesome. Nikki, do you want to get us started with this one? Uh, yeah, I'll touch a little bit on the overall dis uh, description process. Um, well, we do, the DTA uses something called the homosaurus, which is very important to our description process. KJ can give a little bit more in the background of the homosaurus. Um, but that specifically is a list of subject headings that allows us to use queer specific terms when describing items. And to give a very brief background on the archiving side of things, um, typically, historically, we use something called the Library of Congress subject headings, which is a list of subject headings that we can use um, that are standardized that we can use to describe items so that the same words are being used across archives. And that's important so that everyone's using the same terms and we can find things um, even within different archives. The only problem is that, as you can imagine, by a government list of terms, there's not going to be queer specific terms that we really need, especially within the trans community to describe items that people within the community are going to recognize. So when it comes to describing queer items, it's really, really hard to use just the Library of Congress to really get into the nitty gritty. And so luckily, there, we now have the homosaurus, which is so important for the DTA, and it has so many queer specific words. So we pretty much have any word we need for any item um, we can find within the homosaurus. Uh, so that's very important to the DTA. As, as far as when we have misleading information or limited information, there's definitely an aspect of critical thinking when it comes to that, you know, just being trained to look at the details and to, you know, try to release any biases that the writer might have to recognize the time period, things like that when making description decisions. Yeah, so I can kind of answer the other part of, of your question, John, which I think you introduced was how do we handle anachronistic terminology, basically, like what do we do when we find offensive terms that are used in a, in a resource and how do we or do we not make that legible? Um, and to me, this gets at the heart of the challenge that is metadata, that is creating ways of finding historical materials because you're in this weird time vortex where you're in the present moment trying to describe things from the past for future users. Right? So in, in no way that you slice that is it going to be perfect. Um, so what we actually try to do, which kind of bucks, I think, a lot of accepted practice um, is that we actually do use the historical terms. Um, but what we try to do is then offset those with some of the contemporary terms as well, right? Because we are aware that our, our current researchers are going to be much more familiar with the current terms. But the problem is that if you don't use the historical terms, take transvestite, for example, if you're trying to actually do research directly on that topic, then you actually don't have good inroads to, to do research in that area. So one of the great things about the Homosaurus, and again, I can, I can talk a lot about that project, it's kind of, it goes hand in hand with the DTA, is that we have what's called scope notes for all of these terms. So you can see that under transvestite, there's a scope note that's like, this is an offensive term. <laughs> and so we're able to, to do some of that educational work around the terms, uh, but it's still a really, um, new resource for linked data. So it's it's like you can kind of tell from the design of the site that it's not meant to be read and ingested as a site. It's really meant to be used on the back end of projects so that people like at the History Project can describe queer resources more thoroughly. Great. So we have a couple more questions in the chat. And folks, too, if you want to ask your question out loud, just click the hand raise button. We'll make sure that you get unmuted. Um, or I can ask the questions out loud, I don't mind. So um, Kyle asked about the selection process for topic tags and how do you decide which groupings receive a tag? Do you want me to take this, KJ? Sure, yeah. Okay, um, well, when it comes to the topic, the more general topic tags, I mean, of course, with metadata, we're trying to assign as many tags as possible to the items. Um, the, I mean, to an extent, I was going to say the more the better, but that might be a lot. But <laughs> to an extent, um, as much, you know, the more detail, the better, the better things are found. Um, when I 
think about the groupings of the tags. You know, I would think about the thinking about the DTA overall and finding patterns within the DTA and the materials and finding the best way to keep those items connected. So one of the great things is that all these tags are clickable on the site. So if you find a topic tag that interests you, you can always click it and it'll link to other items. So um, that's an important part of the topic tags is to make sure that you're being consistent across um, all the items. All right, I'm gonna unmute you, Jessica, to ask your question. Okay, uh, so my question is just more general, <laughs> which is basically, you know, if one of the goals in starting the DTA was to be able to find more stuff. Um, I just wanted to hear from both of you, you know, what's the most surprising or most interesting or your favorite kind of items? <laughs> I know you probably can't choose one, <laughs> but favorite items on that you've ended up with or something you've been, oh, I didn't think we'd find that. I'm gonna search for a link for you. I don't know, Nikki, if you wanna jump in while I'm doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, it is hard to pick a favorite when there's so many good items on the DTA. I mean, the feeling of finding like a new great item is always, you know, exciting. One item that got me very excited when we, when I, well, when we collaborated with an institution that had it was an institution called British Pathé that specializes in news um, videos. And I was a film undergrad. So I was always trying to find new films. And there's an item that I love on the DTA with a guy named Peter Alexander. So you can always search him. Um, where it was in the 1930s and it's a video of him talking about his life as you know today what might we might view as a trans man and I mean not only is it rare to just see a vid video footage of someone in the 1930s um, talking about their life in that way and, and give, being given the opportunity to do that uh, I just love it because he's like in Australia on a golf course with palm trees and he's like in a suit and a tie and has a tobacco pipe and he's just like talking about his life so that's just a personal favor. <laughs> I don't even know that I've seen that, Nikki. <laughs> so I'll that's find, one of those I'll things too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. Um, so there are things that still surprise me within the collection, not even just as they're coming in. Um, I'll just share quickly a, um, a collection that I'm going to link to, which is Alison Lang's photographs. And I have a special place in my heart for this collection uh, because it was the first collection that we processed for the site. And so <laughs> We had to do it several times, <laughs> so that's partly why I'm really familiar with it, because we messed up a bunch of things. Um, but it's also really a wonderful collection, in part because I've been able to forge a relationship with um, Allison's family. So in the process of making some of these materials uh, available, um, one of her daughters reached out, and we talk every, every like six months or so, and just kind of like check in. and. Um, uh, to be honest, initially she was a, a bit resistant to um, having materials about um, her father. So Alison Lang was a cross-dresser, so lived um, part-time as a woman, part-time as a man. So um, in relationship to um, to Allison's daughter was a father. And so she really was hesitant to have these materials out there. And um, over the years, we continued having conversations about it. And um, Alison Lang's photographs have gotten a lot of press coverage and a lot of circulation and a lot of interest. And, um, and she's really um, become so committed now to like sharing, you know, her her parents' story and is now like trying to do like a documentary on it, is trying to like write, you know, write um, a biography. And it's just this like really wonderful example of like the ways that we can sort of work together with people who are also custodians of these histories. And um, I, I thought for a long time we were gonna have to take all of the materials down and, and we're always happy to do that out of respect when there are moments in which that, that makes the most sense. That's a really good segue into this question from Vivian. So when you are doing collection work or, or when you're collaborating with institutions, do they reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? Um, how did that happen and how does that continue to happen? Nikki, do you want to start with that one? <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll start. Um, it's, it's, you know, a, a very big mix of things between um, the who contacts who first. I mean, I know that many uh, collaborators have reached out to KJ with items, which is always lovely when um, that happens, especially as more people know about the DTA, you know, that's um, 
more it's on more people's minds. When I was there, I w worked as the digital archivist for two years, and um, I did a lot of connecting, like reaching out and um, just making connections. So a lot of my research was done to find items within collections across the world and then reach out to those people, um, to the archives themselves to ask if they could be included in the DTA. And pretty much 100% of the time, people were very excited to be um, collaborating with the DTA and have their items um, be highlighted, which was really amazing. So it's definitely a mix, just like how our processing and digitizing process is a mix. We really um, create unique relationships with each of the collaborators. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. That's great. I mean, I see a number of our collaborators here, so nice to <laughs> nice to see the those of you who we work with. Um, I, the only thing, actually, I will add one thing. Um, we try to, especially with local archives, like um, I see, you know, Ben Powers here from the Sexual Minorities Archives, and so like having the opportunity to actually bring students into these spaces is so powerful and transformative for them. And so, um, whenever possible, and I'm really excited about the, you know. The DTA moving to Northeastern now and so we'll be really close to the history project and when things are possible again you know having the opportunity for to bring students into those spaces and to really get a sense of the relationship between the physical materials and what we're doing to make them accessible online is so important because we want to keep sending people back to those physical spaces. Which we can't wait to to have students and researchers <laughs> and ourselves back in the archives eventually <laughs> once once things are a little bit more uh, safe, um, which actually, again, this segues really well into the next question on my list of questions. Um, Penella or Panea, I apologize uh, if I've mispronounced your name, asks, you know, are there other ways you're working to disseminate, collaborate, or create ways to engage the public beyond um, using you as a research source? Yeah, and I think we're finally at that place where we're ready to be doing more of that work. Um, so for the first several years of the project, we were just kind of doing the frantic baseline work of trying to get the project up and running, get a decent enough size collection so that people would be drawn to the project. And then now we're starting to think uh, outreach. How can we connect people to the project? How can we move this more into high schools, into uh, curriculums? And one of the ways that we're doing that this semester is we're partnering with um, a college class at Appalachian State University, and they're working on a series of primary source sets. So if you're not familiar with these, um, the Digital Public Library of America, for example, has a lot of them. But it's essentially a small thematic curated set of materials from a digital collection with some like discussion questions and information around it. Essentially a nice little neat package that you can hand off to educators and say, here you go. <laughs> like you can use these materials as your starting place so you don't have to confront what can be a, a pretty intimidating process of trying to pull all these materials together yourself. Um, so we're just starting to develop more and more materials like that to help make it easier for people to use the collections. Awesome. So continuing on in the chat, and again, if folks want to do the hand raise thing, I'm happy to unmute you. Um, a couple different folks have mentioned that if you put the Homosaurus logo on a t-shirt, they'd like to buy it. So uh, we can uh, give you some tips on how to do that if you all don't <laughs> already have a t-shirt store. We do not have a t-shirt store. That'd be great. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, we do we'll have stickers, which I'm there. happy to send around too. So. Oh, that would be awesome. It's a great logo, folks, if you haven't seen it. It's a, a dinosaur and a rainbow. Um, and then we have a question from Jonah who wants to know about how much are trans people involved in the decisions made on website policies, collections, etc. cetera? Uh, thoroughly. Um, so our board is almost all trans folks with the exception of two people. Um, I'm also a trans person. So We've had um, trans input at every stage of the process, but I also think it's important to always be mindful of like who's in the room, right? Like who gets to make those actual decisions on, on policies and things that go up on the site. So like the stock answer is like me and most of the board, but then the more nuanced answer is we also try to always do more outreach, right? So um, we get we try to do for targeted feedback with users. We um, we actually sometimes workshop our content with um, younger folks, for example, because that's a really important target audience of ours that we want to make sure that 
things that we're putting up on the site, the copy is accessible to like a 13, 12 or 13 year old audience um, because we, we again want to invite young folks to be using this as a resource. And so we will often um, tap the students in our, who work on the project and who work in the lab and say, okay, I know you have a 13 year old younger brother, younger, younger sibling, like let's bring them in and actually get some feedback on what they think of this page or what they think of this policy. Um, so we're also always trying to be like reaching out and getting more and more feedback whenever we can. All right, Jake, do you want to unmute yourself? All right, here I there we go. Yeah. Well, first of all, just thanks to thanks to y'all for for um, your presentation so far. It's been incredibly uh, informative. So my question is about um, you know you talk a little bit about your decision to to add those kind of like layers of tags of you know transvestite versus trans versus cross dress or whatever it, whatever that may may be, and so I'm wondering if you have come across like resistance to using more um, contemporary terminology for um, past, you know, past identities or, or past groups. Um, and I'm just speaking kind of from, I guess, kind of selfishly from, from my own personal experience working with um, museum audiences where we are trying to like be able to talk accurately about folks that lived in the early 1900s, but also like speak in a way that's not offensive, um, you know, and, and sometimes some of the scholars have been like, no, we cannot use modern technology, modern terminology. Um, and so I'm just wondering, like, if, if y'all have come across similar um, instances, and if you have any maybe advice to give on that. Nikki, do you want to speak to that? Or you want me to jump in on that one? Um, I think, yeah, I think you probably have a <laughs> more nuanced answer for that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something we contend with constantly. Uh, I mean, even the framing of this as the digital transgender archive presents a problem because it it's an overreading then of everything in the collection, right? It's a way of saying everything in our holdings is transgender and that is not right. It's not historically accurate. It's not what we're trying to do, uh, which is why I spent so much time on the scope statement and sharing that too, because we really try to break out of the distinction between how people identify and their kind of their practices as they move through the world. And it's not as if you can't have both of those things happening at the same time, but it's certainly much easier when we have the lexicon available to us. And so, you know, even for people who, who have lived in the, you know, the past 30, 40 years, when they have that language available and they choose not to use it, well, that is a really helpful data point for us, right? We can use that as a way of saying, okay, so I'm going to be very careful and not disrespectfully add these labels to you. Um, and so we try to use it as a teaching moment, but again, it, it can be hard because there seem to be too few opportunities to do that, right? A lot of the nuance gets lost along the way. And as an academic, as someone who works in this area, that's like one of the most frustrating parts of the project is that I can't control the usage or I can't try to like educate sometimes about the ways that these materials are interpreted, um, but I can continue to try to work on the, the tool and the archive itself and keep trying to do better with that. All right, so Julie has a question. Julie, did you want to ask it or do you want me to ask it? Uh, I can ask it because I also have a comment first. Um, but yeah, um, as others have said, thank you. Um, I'm uh, connecting from New Zealand. Uh, I'm normally in Boston, but uh, my family is here. And um, so my comment was just that the first thing I did was went to the map and was really excited to see um, some items listed on New Zealand and clicked through and, and was intrigued to see that um, you know, one of them was nearby and it was actually an item, um, a publication somewhere not in New Zealand, but it contained an article um, that mentioned New Zealand. And so it was, it was interesting to be able to, to make those connections to things outside of the location. But, um, but my question was, um, was also that the National um, Museum here um, has um, significant digital collections now um, or digitizing their, their actual items. Um, and it, a lot of it has been curated, um, tagged as queer and, and a lot of it in particular is trans. Um, and um, I don't think I saw them, I mean, I didn't see any of their items on the map and I don't think they're 
connected to you. Um, and I'd be curious to know, um, um, you know, how I should go about encouraging them, you know, or connecting them to this project to see if they'll share. Um, and just another comment, one of the interesting things they've done lately even is they actually had an exhibit of their, um, of their trans collections and invited local trans artists to come and view it and make art based on that historical experience, which they then added to their collection, um, which was really wonderful. But yeah, I'm wondering how to get that into this collection. Uh, that's great. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, the easiest way is to just reach out to me, right? So you can kind of involve me in the in the conversations and I'm happy to sort of make those connections with you. Um, but of course, if someone is already there and is working, you know, you have established relationships, great. You can, I would be grateful if you could start that conversation for us um, and put us in touch. I just dropped my email in the chat. And um, yeah, I mean, so much of the inertia of this project has been precisely through those kinds of connections. And so we're always grateful for that. Um, so I appreciate that. So uh, Marsha had a question that has sort of floated up. Um, it's a question that, as I think back on this now, I heard you talk at New England Archivists at some point. I think we were on Cape Cod, so who knows what year that was. Um, and I feel like this question comes up a lot. So Holy Cross, Holy Cross <laughs> is where the archive is, or was? <laughs> yeah, that's usually the whole question too. It's just like, Holy Cross, the tilted head, right? <laughs> yes, um, I could, as you might assume, give a much longer answer to that question. Um, but in short, you know, Holy Cross, because it was a, is, is a Jesuit institution and has a, a very clear social justice mission, was in many ways quite welcoming to the project. So I felt fully supported um, as a faculty member there. And it was a great place to be able to, you know, bring students into this project. And opening the lab on campus had um, measurably transformative effects for the queer students on campus. And uh, Nikki could testify to that as well. I mean, it was just amazing to see the ways that they would sort of latch onto the project in their first year and then spend the next four years, you know, working in the lab and really creating that as a second home for themselves. In, in many ways, sometimes we had to <laughs> sort of rest the space back. Um, but it, it was a wonderful um, addition to campus culture in that way. Um, yeah, so that's the short answer to the question. I don't know, Nikki, if you want to share anything about the lab. Uh, I do want to shout out the Holy Cross students um, because they did so much work on the project. Actually, as an archivist, something that people are always really surprised to hear is how many volunteers we have, student volunteers working on the project. We would only have a, you know, a handful, two to four really paid students or research assistants or team leaders, I guess they were, um, on the project. And then we would have, you know, I would say average around 10-ish volunteers um, sometimes they were part of classes, but uh, they were all really amazing and it was just really awesome. Like KJ said, to see how much they connected to the project and to watch um, the team leaders, you know, guide them through the project. And just as an archivist to see them get so excited about the items and to really fully understand the importance of metadata, which is like probably really geeky to most people. But, you know, by the end, they were always like, you know what, this makes sense. And I'm like, thank you. It does. I know. <laughs> um, so they did actually most of the metadata. Um, you know, I would look through it afterward, of course, and then KJ would as well. But um, they wrote most of it and they were just amazing. I was always very excited to have the students working. So a shout out to the Holy Cross students. <laughs> yeah. And um... Marcy, I see your additional comment there. I, I will say uh, to get a, a bit more frank that, you know, part of what made, one thing that made the DTA challenging at, a, at Holy Cross at a Catholic institution was actually all the pressure from the outside. So I was routinely the target of Catholic based uh, hate campaigns. And that was really difficult because it made my job harder. It made, it made it more challenging for me to focus on the work of the DTA. Um, and they were always really, from my perspective, terribly timed. So it was like right before I would go up for tenure, they would do these email campaign campaigns where they would send, you know, I forget, like 20,000 emails to the president saying I shouldn't get tenured, right? And so there was definitely like a way in which I was having to fight external forces in order to try to keep the project successful um, or my own livelihood. <laughs> but um, 
you know, I, moving to Northeastern uh, was, it was certainly attractive to be able to move to a secular institution in addition to all the other resources that are now going to be available for the project. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and uh, thank you for persisting, which I'm, I'm taking the words directly from Panela or Panea in the chat, because it's such an important and interesting and unique resource and collaborative project that you've brought together. Um, I have a question about actually the scope of time that you talk about. So um, pre-2000, which makes sense to me, like what you were saying about, you know, the, the rise of the internet and, and sort of a, a newer abundance of channels to sort of find examples of trans experience on the internet. Um, but by limiting yourself to earlier than 2000, are you finding that there are parts of the trans experience that are more represented or less represented? I'm thinking particularly about race or, you know, masculine or feminine experience or however else. Yes, <laughs> with an emphatic yes. Um, and if you actually start poking around much, you'll see that we break that that scope policy all the time. And one of the main ways that we break it is through our collaborations with oral history projects. Um, and we've, we've put um, a lot of effort into making sure that those oral history projects are represented in the DTA, um, in, in part because even though a lot of them, like so many of them are talking about pre-2000 history, so they would technically qualify as part of our scope, um, but many of them are, are not and they're more recent. And the reason why we are really enthusiastic about those types of materials is because they help to, to provide a more rich story than archival documents can. And so I think it's especially important when you're thinking about oppressed communities to always be aware of what the records are able to show and what they're obscuring, right? Because what is counted as history? What kinds of objects are, are archivable and, or are rendered legible in the historical record? And within trans communities, of course, I mean, we're we don't have to be sociologists to assume all of the ways in which, you know, people with relative power within trans communities are able to both document and preserve and make accessible their histories, right? So working on things like oral histories is a way to start compensating for those absent archives, um, but it's, it's not enough, right? So I, I say that and I'm doing that and I'm actually, I'm starting to collaborate on a, a much larger scale oral history project under the trans um, archive umbrella. But I'm also like really trying to think more creatively about ways of addressing those archival gaps. And um, I'm still just kind of frustrated with the, the kind of lack of evidence and the ways that we're trying to like plug in certain types of evidence into what are often colonial frameworks of understanding history. So, sorry, I got a little academic there. <laughs> Let's give some thumbs up. Um, but I think it's a it's a real issue. I, and because people who have been collecting archives, collecting materials in archives, um, are either getting them from people who know that their materials should be archived or know about archives or care about history, or have the ability to care about hanging on to their stuff, or the actual ability to hang on to their stuff over time. So if you're um, living in any, I'm soapboxing everyone, I apologize. Well, people keep writing questions in the chat. But, you know, if you're worried about, am I going to get arrested? Am I going to get murdered? Am I going to get kicked out of my house? Um, am I going to have food on the table? Are you really caring about your record? Can you? Can you hang on to those things? And if those are the only things that are there for historians to use to write history, who's being completely left out of that history? So um, yeah, it just oral history is a great way to kind of get at that. Um, and there are other things that I think pop up over time too. Um, the history project also deals with, with that issue as well, because once you start going further back, the, the easier things to find are people who were rich, people who had privilege, people um, who could, we have these great photos from the 1940s and we have them because somebody could afford to have their own black, black room to develop the photos. Like, you know, it's those other things. 
um, that are all part of life that go into what ends up in archives and, and how do we decolonize that practice as we head forward to make sure that 20 years from now, some, some new archivists aren't swearing at us for not collecting the things that they wanna see. Well, um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll add one like quick addendum to that too, uh, Joan, is I, I think that's super important. And, and sometimes I, I find myself giving too much power to like researchers and to future users of archives. But I think that one of the really transformative and profound things that, you know, the DTA, the History Project, the Sexual Minorities Archives, the Lesbian Her Story Archives, all of these projects can do is actually convey to people who are alive that their lives matter, right? That like, you know, we, we care about you, we care about your, your existence, your experiences. And, and so I think that in the moment we can offer these at times life-saving effects. And I just, I, I always wanna keep remembering the people in the moment too, not just the, the future researchers, because I do think we have a, a present influence that sometimes we overlook. Absolutely. So folks, does anyone else, um, we have, we have some time. Does anyone else have any questions or comments they want to make? Uh, anyone want to do the hand raise? Andrew, you're unmuted. I thought Mark maybe had a question, but I think he was just here hearing somebody's comment. All right, we're, we're enjoying a moment, <laughs> just a moment <laughs> of quiet. Um, I want to ask oh, Meta. a question. Oh, yeah, Gordine. Is that okay? Yeah, um, in terms of, I think it's really important, like the invisible people who don't have the archives. Um, my partner and I did a radio show for many years, Gender Talk uh, Radio. And one of the interviews that, that really hit me the most was speaking to a young uh, Muslim trans man in Kyrgyzstan and him talking about what his life was like. And we have, we have those archived on a, on a site, but his voice was just something that we don't that we don't normally uh, hear in his relationship with his family, his community, his fears, uh, and how how tenuous everything uh, was. Do you you mentioned you have video? Do you take any um, audio archives? Nikki, do you want to do this one? I've been talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Absolutely um take audio I, I don't i don't i'm trying to think if, if we have any audio examples on there but i think that would be a wonderful addition to the okay. dta yeah. i'm assuming that was would have been kj's answer yes yes <laughs> thank you yes and um gender talk is a great is a great resource um i've really appreciated a lot of those um different sessions so kudos yeah, for all it, your work it on was that. such a privilege to be able to talk to people whose voices were underrepresented. And I think that that touched us more than anything else. Thank you, Gordine, and hello to Nancy too. Oh, Gordine and Nancy you. are <laughs> historic in their, their own right um, and really wonderful to, to hear from you. So um, we have actually two questions from uh, Denise and Angel that are, um, kind of similar about diversity within the DTA. Um, would you be willing to share screen again and show us uh, any examples of black and brown trans people? And then we'll finish up, I think, with a question from Meta who has her hand raised. Nikki, do you mind doing that? And you, um, maybe we mm -hmm. can point out the race and ethnicity research guide. Yeah. Um, so there's, as you might imagine, a long and complicated answer to this. The short answer is that um, the DTA is not sufficiently diverse with respect to race and ethnicity, um, meaning that it, there is overrepresentation of white people. So I'll, I'll start there. Um, we have also had to navigate some 
metadata practices and so practices of describing materials where we're trying to make sure that we're taking the same care in describing and attributing race that we do with describing and attributing gender. And so um, we early on started developing additional resources like this race and ethnicity research guide to help point people to collections within the DTA um, where you can start to learn more about the intersections of um, people who are both experiencing gender-based discrimination as well as racial discrimination. And so in many of these cases, um, these are, are histories that are, are representing um, people who are struggling. So that is one of the frustrating parts about the misrepresentation of history that we have here. Um, you will find a lot of white people partying and having fun and you will find black and brown folks in the street in many cases, right? Who are out there picketing and protesting. And so this juxtaposition is something that we're really attuned to. Um, what I was saying about metadata, because we're not in the position of trying to impose identities upon people, it can be really hard to include metadata that is not assuming and um, kind of reading people's race through say photographs. And so what we often try to do, like we, we do with gender as a practice, so we move it as a practice rather than an identity. So instead of saying that person is transgender or that person is a cross-dresser, we try to shift it to say, what is it that they're doing in this moment? And if we can capture that and help to include some tags that will lead researchers to those collections, we do that. But we're trying to walk a really fine line between not making assumptions about people's identities, but yet also representing um, you know, what their lives were about. So that's the short answer to that question. Um, I would also say that this is something that we are always actively like working on um, community relationships with. And so, you know, we are trying to not only uh, include more collections, but also think about ways that our scope of collecting is biased, right? So it's not even just like, okay, we need to go to this collection that uh, represents more black trans folks. It's actually thinking more about like, okay, so what is it about how we consider archival materials archival that is limiting what we have decided to include in the collection? Thank you. And thank you, Denise. It's good to see you too. I hope things are going well on the other side of the river. Um, Thank you, Nikki, for pulling that up too. All right, and sort of final, I like to get people at around eight um, because I think it's either cocktail hour or bedtime for, for most of us. Um, so Meta, you have last question. You have your hand raised. Uh, yes, uh, my question is for Nikki specifically. Could you talk a little bit about what it was like to transition from your role as archivist into board member and what that sort of looks like? Thank you. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, well, it's unfortunately for me a lot more hands off only because I was there full time under a grant, which was really amazing. So I got to be there in the lab uh, at Holy Cross day in day out with the students. So that nothing's ever, you know, can't compare to that experience. Um, but as a board member, you know, I'm still always, I think it's now ingrained in my DNA to be looking for trans history in all corners. So I know KJ knows that every time I see anything, even a mention of something that I know is on the DTA, I'm gonna be emailing him about it to make sure that that gets on the list. So, you know, I still, am, I'm really grateful that I can still be uh, connected to the DTA in that way. And to be able to still, um, you know, contribute to the DTA in the way of finding new stories and hoping to uh, work to keep guiding the DTA a little bit in the future. I'm very thankful for KJ, um, uh, for KJ for letting me stay on with the DTA in that way. Well, and I just have to say, I'm not a professionally trained archivist. And so, you know, Nikki's role in this project has been transformational. And so having someone come on board who really has so much expertise in, in metadata and processing, and I mean, the whole uh, way our lab worked was absolutely transformed by Nikki. So I was delighted that she was willing to stay on to the board. Thank you, KJ. <laughs> All right, I think that's our last question. Um, I just wanna say again, KJ and Nikki, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with us all tonight. Um, it's really wonderful getting to know 
uh, more of the ins and outs of the DTA. And now that we're neighbors, uh, hopefully we can continue some, some collaborating. Um, and thank you all to everyone who came here tonight. Like I said, if you don't know the History Project, we're Boston's LGBTQ community archives. Um, we are here for the LGBTQ community. We document, preserve, and share preserve and share our LGBTQ history. Um, you'll get a follow-up email from me. Please follow us on social media, support our work if you can, or signal boost us if you're interested or, or willing to. Um, we'll see you again, hopefully soon at another virtual event. And like I said, someday in the archives when we can be a little less socially distant. Uh, and with that, I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank everyone. you all. Thank you. How do I stop recording? There we go.